Simon Cadwell, his family, and a friend were all followers of Simon's extreme spiritual beliefs. In 2007, the group had planned an extended vacation to Brazil for a spiritual retreat and were never seen again. Oh, and Simon Cadwell's name wasn't Simon Cadwell. This is Monster Mysteries. Gary Felton was born in the United Kingdom in 1962. He began working for a software company in 1986 where he met a man named Simon Cadwell. Gary managed to steal Simon's birth certificate and get a passport made in his name. After that, he began traveling under that identity. He traveled throughout the United States and then India. He was focused on spirituality and prophecy. While in India in 1993, Gary met an Australian woman named Deborah, and the two began living in an Indian ashram. Like most budding cult leaders do, Gary must have gotten Deborah to distance herself from her family because they reported her missing. After some investigation, her family located her in India, but she wouldn't stay there long. In the mid 1990s, Gary and Deborah moved to Melbourne and Victoria, Australia. At some point, it's unclear if it was before or after the move, the couple had a son together named Daniel. In 1997, Gary, then 35, met 17-year-old Chantel McDougall while he was giving a seminar. Chantel quickly became a follower of his beliefs and moved in with Gary, Deborah, and Daniel. Gary believed himself to be a shaman of sorts. He believed that the world was at the end of a 75,000-year cycle, and soon the world would transform into a new plane. Gary started what he called a humanitarian group, but it was really just a cult. He described it as, The Fellowship of Truth consists of a vast array of beings who reside within multifarious worlds throughout all of the manifested spheres of creation. Their lives are dedicated to serving the divine plan of evolution in whatever system they may happen to be transversing or inhabiting. There is only one fellowship of truth which is as ancient as the universe itself, and it incorporates all those who tread the path of righteousness and who give of themselves in service to the whole. Therefore, members of this grand body are automatically designated by way of their natural tendencies to simultaneously seek the truth and to serve their fellows. Truth Fellowship is a committed group of people who represent just one of the myriad divisions of an intergalactic confederation of helpers who abide in obedience to the universal will. The work of Truth Fellowship, a non-profit humanitarian group, is manifold. However, one important aspect of its responsibility and honor is to serve humanity by offering a complete, true, and dependable system of preparation and spiritual unfoldment, which includes personal healing, in accordance with the new and adjusted laws of the Aquarian Age. What the fuck is the Aquarian Age? Obviously, I know what the astrological signs are, but that phrase means something specific. Now, I'm not an expert in this, but from my brief research, this is what I've gathered. The Earth apparently has a bit of a wobble to it as it rotates on its axis. Completing that circular wobble takes 24,000 years. It is then broken up into 12 parts, giving us 12 2,000-year-long ages that match the astrological signs. In the early 2000s, we were coming out of the Pisces Age and about to go into the Aquarian Age. The official beginning of the Aquarian Age was November 11, 2011. Of course it was, 11-11-11. That was the dawning of the Age of Aquarius. Now I kind of wish I had long hair. Hmm. Gary wrote a book in 1998 titled Servers of the Divine Plan, Essential Keys to Awakening and Remembrance. The back of the book says, Mankind and planet Earth have today arrived at a crucial juncture in the evolutionary journey. At the close of this 75,000-year major cycle, a new world is about to be born. Our globe has consequently become a busy nucleus of activity for interested parties originating from other planets, galaxies, and dimensions. 
members of various interstellar and transgalactic confederations, have moved closer to Earth in order to assist in the now imminent Great Transition, which shall positively affect all life on our world. The destiny of ages is nigh. I'm not sure where the 75,000 number came from. It doesn't match anything else I've looked up regarding the Aquarian Age and the length of its cycles. But you don't become a successful cult leader without taking some liberties with reality. I wouldn't say it was a bestseller. It's currently just under 20 million in the Amazon book rankings. But it did sell some copies, and it gained Gary some followers who were actually called servers. In 2000, Gary, Deborah, Daniel, and Chantel had moved to a coastal town called Florite in Western Australia, just west of Perth. Once there, a server named Justine Smith moved in with them. It seemed that Gary was on his way to true cult leader status. He had three women living with him, following his every word. Not only had Deborah already had a child with Gary, but now Chantel was pregnant with his second child. In 2001, she would give birth to a daughter named Leela. Gary began conducting his teachings, that was in air quotes, on an internet forum called The Gateway. His servers, who referred to themselves collectively as The Forecourt, knew their leader simply as Psy. It's reported that he didn't have a job, he just spent his nights communicating with his 30 to 40 servers and slept all day. It turned out that the group love situation wasn't right for everyone in the house. The relationships became strained, so Gary, Chantel, and Leela moved to the small town of Nanup in Western Australia, south of Perth. Their friend and member of the Truth Fellowship, Tony Popick, joined them a few years later. He lived in a caravan, which is a camper trailer, on the property of the house Gary and Chantel were renting. Nanup was a small town with about 500 residents at the time of the disappearance. People in the town said Chantel and Tony were very friendly and well-liked in town, but a neighbor, Bruce Blackburn, called Gary a narcissist. He described Gary as someone who always demanded attention. He spent the little time he did outside of the home ranting about electromagnetic fields. A utility company had recently installed a new transformer near their rental home, and Gary was insistent that the electromagnetic waves were harming his family. Bruce said that Gary buried magnets around his property in an effort to divert the waves away from his house. Bruce said one of the last times he saw Gary, the man told him that the electromagnetic waves were killing him and his daughter, and that he had gone to the doctor to get some sort of medicine. Now, electromagnetic radiation is in fact harmful. Some of the most dangerous forms of electromagnetic radiation come from X-rays, microwaves, gamma rays, and ultraviolet light. Most of these are things we don't have regular contact with, though, as microwave ovens are sealed to contain the radiation that cooks our food. X-rays are used sparingly during medical procedures, and gamma radiation just isn't something we normally have contact with. Ultraviolet light is harder to dodge since it's in sunlight, but that's why we wear sunscreen if we're going to be out in the sun for long periods of time. What I think Gary is referring to is the electromagnetic field that is given off by a large electrical device. There have been studies that have shown adverse side effects to long-term exposure when living directly by an electrical transformer, but the conclusions are still highly debated. It's been reported that an ex-boyfriend of Chantel's told police that so-called Simon Cadwell was not who he seemed. In 2007, Gary was pulled over during a routine traffic stop and briefly questioned by the officer. The officer said that Gary was nervous and uncomfortable about answering questions about where he had come from. Chantel's mother, Catherine, had visited her daughter about two months before the family disappeared. She said that she spent 10 days at their home and said, quote, I had a terrible feeling that something weird or strange was going on, end quote. Catherine said they received a passport in the mail for Leela during the time she was visiting and had a secretive meeting. An investigation revealed that the application for the passport had been submitted the day after Gary had been pulled over. In the weeks leading up to their disappearance, they started preparing for an extended trip to Brazil. Chantel had bred long-haired dachshunds, and she sold her breeding dog and its puppies. They told their friends and family about their trip, explaining that they were going to Rio Branco, Brazil, which is a hotspot for cult activity. 
Chantel told her parents that they would be living in a commune by the Amazon River and would be doing charity work. The family called their landlord and told them that they were leaving and that they could keep or sell their furniture. He declined the offer, but they left everything behind anyway. It was reported that they left most of their belongings, wallets, credit cards, computers, and even dirty dishes on the table as if they just got up from a meal and walked out the door. The landlord said that everything else had been spotlessly cleaned. There was a note left that simply read, quote, gone to Brazil, end quote. It's known that after leaving their home, they drove to Bustleton about an hour away from Nanup. On July 13, 2007, they sold their car at a car dealership for $4,000 and left in a vehicle that had been waiting for them. That's the last official sighting of Gary Felton, Chantel McDougall, Leela McDougall, and Tony Popic. The money from the sale of the car was deposited into their bank account, but the bank account hasn't been touched since. Tony's father told investigators that he had recently given his son $25,000, which he was told was needed for a legal matter. So what happened to the cult leader and his flock? Some believe that they did indeed go to Brazil. The Australian Immigration Department says that there's no evidence that they left the country, but they may still have managed to sneak out. They could have used fake identities or left under the radar on a boat. If that's the case, there have been no reports of them in the area around Rio Branco. Australian investigators have worked with Brazilian authorities to look into cult activities in Rio Branco and have found no signs of them. In 2011, investigators were looking into the possibility that the four had died in a plane crash on July 17, 2007. TAN Airlines Flight 3054 was a regularly scheduled domestic flight from Porto Alegre to Sao Paulo, Brazil. While coming in for a landing at Congoejas Airport, water on the runway caused the plane to slide past the runway into a warehouse adjacent to a shell filling station. The plane exploded on impact, killing all 187 crew and passengers and 12 people on the ground. The heat from the fire was so intense that more than 70 bodies were either unidentified or unrecovered. The passenger manifest didn't include any names of the missing group, but Gary had a history of altering his identity, so they looked into it a bit further. Most of the passengers were Brazilian, but one American and three South Africans were listed on the manifest, which may have raised some suspicions. But the Brazilian authorities have said that they can't find any evidence that it was the missing family. On top of that, traveling from Porto Alegre to Sao Paulo doesn't make sense if the group were in fact planning to go to Rio Blanco, which is on the other side of the country. In 2013, Australian authorities discovered that a man using Tony's driver's license had stayed the night at a hostel in Northbridge, Perth, on July 15, 2007. Earlier that day, the man had taken a train from Bunbury, which was a coastal town between Nanup and Perth. Tony's cell phone had been used to purchase train tickets from Perth to Kalgoorlie, and it was confirmed that the ticket was used. He had purchased a ticket to return to Perth, but the authorities couldn't confirm if anyone had used the ticket. The train tickets were purchased under the name J. Roberts. It could have been Tony, but it also could have been Gary. Maybe Gary decided to steal another identity. Or it's possible they gave Tony's identification to someone else to throw authorities off their trail. The owner of the hostel was familiar with Gary, so if he had stayed there, you'd think that he would remember seeing him. In 2016, an English-speaking homeless woman in Rome, Italy, was suspected of being Leela. Pictures of her next to seven-year-old Leela before she disappeared started circulating on social media. Locals eventually reported to police that the girl was in trouble and they brought her into the station for questioning. She had no identification on her and told them her name was Maria and that she was 20 years old, though police said the birth date she gave them would make her 21. They let her go because she hadn't done anything wrong. People in the area said she was polite and refused to accept any help or even money. People also theorized that the woman was Madeline McCann, who disappeared at age three while on vacation with her family in Portugal. The problem is that Madeline McCann would have only been 13 years old at the time this woman was discovered, and she was clearly older than that. She was also suggested to be Amanda Adlai, who was abducted from West Bloomfield, Michigan in 2008 at the age of seven, and Maria Bridget Henselman, who disappeared in Friedberg, Germany in 2013 when she was 13 years old. 
Not long after the photos went online, the woman's father, Tavo Hoyarvi, came forward revealing that she was in fact his 21-year-old daughter, Embla, who had been missing for six months. Tavo said that they lived in Stockholm, Sweden, and that she traveled to Italy six months ago to study the Italian language, and he hadn't heard from her since. He had attempted to get authorities in Sweden to help him find her, but they told him there was nothing they could do since she was an adult. Which is bullshit that they give that as a reason to not investigate a missing person. Adults can go missing and be in danger too. Especially since Tavo said Embla had Asperger's syndrome, and based on her situation in Italy, she was clearly suffering from some form of mental illness. Other people believed they stayed in Australia and went into hiding. Either their plans to go to Brazil were just a ruse to throw off anyone who was looking for them, or they changed their plans at the last minute. The stay in the hostel and the train tickets could be evidence that they were carrying out a plan that would have them remain in the country. The last theory is, of course, that they're dead. When police examined Gary's computer, they found messages he had written in his online journal that said, quote, I'm exhausted and the only option left is to leave this world, end quote. Most of Gary's servers claimed that suicide was never a goal in the group, but one follower claimed that Psy had personally told him about his plan to kill himself and his family by taking a drug called Nebutal. Nebutal is a barbiturate that's used for short-term sleep aid to treat insomnia. It can also be used as an emergency treatment for seizures. The server said that Gary later told him that he changed his mind and claimed that he wanted to live in isolation instead. Other people claimed that Gary didn't believe in suicide and believed that death was the only way to ascend to another dimension. People also cite the deaths of two Canadian servers of the Truth Fellowship shortly after meeting Gary in 2007. Kirk Helgeson and Alexander Faminoff went on vacation to Australia in the summer of 2007. While there, they traveled to Nanup and met with Gary, or Sai as they knew him. They were devoted to his philosophical teachings, but it's unknown what he told the pair. After returning to Canada, on July 24th, a week after Gary and his family went missing, Alexander took his own life with an overdose of pentobarbital, which is a barbiturate like nebutal. A month later, Kirk and a woman named Christina Arnott died of a drug overdose while in Massachusetts in the United States. It's believed that they also overdosed on pentobarbital. People that were close to Gary don't believe he would have committed suicide. Justine Smith was questioned after the group's disappearance and said she believed that they were all still alive. While she lived with Gary, all three women worked to support him. He was controlling, and one time after she tried to leave, Gary held her up against a wall in anger. She believes that he would go into hiding to continue his control over other people. Clinical psychologist Chris Geisen analyzed the group's behavior and believes that they are all dead. She believes that they all followed through with a suicide pact to ascend to another dimension. I personally feel like the most likely scenario is that they're dead. No activity, thousands of dollars in the bank that has never been touched. Why sell your car and put the money in the bank if you're not going to use it? Why not just ditch the car? Gary was getting increasingly depressed and he seems like the type of coward that would end his life as an easy way out, taking other people with him. People say he knew how to vanish, but he stole one identity and lived under that name for 15 years while nobody had any reason to be looking for him. Deborah's parents couldn't find her for a while because they were living in an ashram, but they weren't really hiding and they were eventually found. I don't know if that really counts as knowing how to vanish. Once authorities are actively looking for you, it's a lot harder to just disappear and never be seen again. Could they be living off-grid somewhere in the middle of nowhere? Sure, but it just seems so unlikely that not one of them would turn up somewhere. What do you think happened to Gary Felton, Chantel and Leela McDougall, and Tony Popic? Let me know in the comments, or you can check out my new community on Reddit, r forward slash thisismonsters, where you can discuss the topics of these videos. Thanks! If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800- 799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233 or go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. 
The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will instantly take your browser to a Google search page. In the event the abuser is nearby, you can assure that you don't get caught trying to get help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Be safe. Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. Also, remember that if you'd like to support the show, the easiest way is to donate a few bucks at Buy Me A Coffee or check out some of our merchandise at Teespring. You can find information on how to do that along with links to our social media at thisismonsters.com. Thanks again.